Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It is Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar, and we're also joined by our good friend, Joseph Solis Mullen. What's up, brother? How are you? Hey, I'm great, Henry. It's great to talk to you both again. It's been a while. I think it's been a couple of months since you last been on the show. And what's interesting, I was looking at my notes um, from like the last time we spoke, or the first time we spoke, and can you believe it? It's from April 2021. Wow. So we've been talking for over three years at this years. point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Isn't that crazy? Who would have thought you'd yeah, still time be showing flies. up? Yeah. <laughs> you must like us. <laughs> you, must, you must enjoy. And we well, like we, you. We enjoy We love talking to you. So um, we, we are always grateful when you're generous with your time and it's a time for excitement because we never had a chance to follow up with you and, and have a conversation. And honestly, today's show, we're going to talk about a bunch of things. Um, I guess first to introduce Joe. Joe is a political scientist. He's a researcher, um, economist, uh, really brilliant guy for, for those who haven't um, heard other episodes with him on. But today we're going to talk about the geopolitical situation or whatever you want to call it, our our quote unquote 2020 tw- or 2020 our 2024 forecast and joe just released a book called i have it in my hand right here called the fake china threat and it's very real danger and congratulations man this is awesome yeah congrats thanks uh thanks to both of you i i really appreciate the the institute all the great work they've been doing there and uh there's going to be a, an expanded paperback version coming with a several additional uh, lectures that I've been traveling around giving at various universities uh, that are going to be included. So uh, the original publication was meant to be kept as slim as possible to, to keep the argument on point. But for those who thought, oh, you know, I wish you would have talked more about this, wish you would have talked more about that, uh, the paperback that's going to be coming later this year from the Institute is going to be uh, significantly expanded uh, in in several key ways. Uh, more on Chinese history, more on the history of Sino-American relations, uh, more on the domestic dynamics driving the fake China threat narrative. So very exciting, very exciting. And the great thing is, and I'm not saying that we would we want less pages and words from you, but the book is what about 80 pages or so. Mm-hmm. So I recently bought. My um, so a couple of years ago wasn't recently. I bought my father-in-law the book Stalin's War, and Stalin's War is eight hundred and sixty something pages long. <laughs> Ten times longer. <laughs> and that book, and whenever I go, whenever I go to my in-laws' house, the book is basically used as like a um, paperweight, you know, <laughs> because it's the size of a phone book. And like the font is super big too in the book, so it looks like it's it just is the size of a you know the King James Bible. It just looks intimidating where you would never not want to want to read it. Um, I like books that are to the point, and um, you know you spare no word to to make your case. And I guess it's worth really going over. Maybe just you don't need to give us a full summary of the book, but. Um, and of course we've talked about it a bunch over, over the past couple of three years, but maybe you can just outline what is the fake China threat? 
Sure. The, the fake China threat is, is the idea that China is somehow bent on or capable of dominating the world in an attempt at global hegemony similar to that enjoyed and attempted by the United States since the end of the Cold War and particularly since the disintegration of the Soviet Union. I think the most telling way to summarize uh, the, what the actual China threat constitutes in the mind of Washington planners and thinkers, people in the Pentagon, comes from Rex Tillerson, from Bob Woodward's book that he wrote on, well, one of the books that he wrote on the Trump years. Rex Tillerson was talking to Trump and he said, look, the real, the real threat from China is that they threaten the total U.S. D naval domination of the Pacific Ocean right up to China's shores. And so that's the real, that's the real thing that is under threat here. It's the ability of the U.S. Navy to go wherever they want, whenever they want, with no consequences, behaving in a manner that Americans and Washington would never put up with from anyone else. And so that is the actual China threat. That is why the military buildup and the posturing and the containment strategy is happening right now. So it's not, I repeat, not an actual threat to Americans, their prosperity, their well-being, their freedom. This is not going to be like Red Dawn 3 or something where the Chinese come pouring over the Canadian border or something like that. That's not what it is. And I, I give them all the myriad reasons why that isn't the case, and that even if the Chinese government, uh, Beijing, secretly were plotting that, why it would just never happen. And uh, we, it started, it started much longer than that. And then uh, Keith Knight, who's a, a great guy over there, um, he and several of the editorial team, we spent the whole of last summer cutting, 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 condensing, sharpening the language, and just trying to get things pared down to as frankly, as few words as possible while still maintaining all the essentials of each of the arguments that I go into. Everything from China's demographics to its existing military posture to its neighbors to its strategic situation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because I, I'm aware that long form reading is just dying. Uh, it's not my preference. Uh, I love reading books. Uh, I wouldn't say the longer, the better. Uh, I love all sorts of books, uh, but just being realistic, feeling that it's very important for people to hear an alternate perspective. I don't even ask that people agree with my opinion, only that they consider that maybe, just maybe, this cottage industry of books that have cropped up that are trying to scare Americans into a new arms race and into doing something really crazy like fighting China in a conventional war right in its backyard um, is just is not necessary. It's not for our benefit. And uh, I do devote some time to talking about the domestic drivers of this narrative, including the, the cottage industry of books that have popped up, uh, you know, showing their ties to the defense industry. I mean, these are not disinterested people who just show up and write these books. Um, it's a huge pain in the butt and an inconvenience to write a book. I was not pleased to have to write this book, but it just seemed like the book wasn't going to come, even though all the material was just obviously there for anyone who cared to look and had the ability to write a book. It sounds like a real and passion so, pro project. <laughs> I, I wasn't no, it was, it was to not, write I, this. I griped about it constantly, but every day I, I read multiple papers every day. I read the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post every day, and I, I suffer through a New York Times every once in a while. Oh, and, boy. Just every day, every day, China doing this, China doing that. Isn't it dangerous and threatening what China is doing? Look how they look how belligerent they are. They cut off one of our fighter jets. And it's like, wasn't that like right off the coast of <laughs> China, though? Like, you know, they make it sound like it happened right off the coast of California. But of course it didn't. Um, so, no, I mean, China is not... Uh, you know, in, in a position to to challenge the United States in its hemisphere, and certainly they have have no no ability to try uh, to project uh, power and influence in the way the United States has over the past uh, 25, 30 years. And if they were smart, they'd look at how it went for the United <clears throat> States, and they wouldn't even try. I mean, what better example of failure do you need than that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know. So, uh, yeah, there was the book, and then. Uh, yeah, there's there's more lectures coming on that. Um, the first two were on. Um, they were fairly lengthy. I mean, they were about ten thousand words. So, uh, I mean, something like twenty five pages worth of worth of material. Uh, one was on the 
uh, like a full history of, of China because I really had to skimp on that stuff because even though it's very fascinating and perhaps informative, it's just not central to the argument about what's going on today. Right. Uh, then I had one on the, the history of Sino-American relations, which is much more important, but I did have to kind of skim through things to really get at the nitty gritty, the three communiques, the reason for opening to China, the reason for shifting away from, you know, trying to incorporate China into the, you know, existing order. Um, that Washington dominates uh, back about 15 years ago. Uh, and then the next one, this one I'm really excited about. This is one the, the one I'm most excited about, actually. It's um, the fake China threat in the future of freedom in America. Because war is, of course, the health of the state. And permanent war, the war on terror, for example, uh, the Cold War before it, it resulted in the transformation of American society and reinterpretations of the Constitution in ways that were just incredible and that are very, uh, it would be difficult to explain to someone who, you know, died in, say, 1970 to explain what the, the way things are now and the purview and power of the government. Um, that's not to say the government didn't do a lot of sketchy and illegal things before that. One of my, one of my favorite stories, and I, I think I've shared it with you and your audience before, but it was about my my grandfather, who was actually asked to silently allow this to go on. I mean, they would they would physically go into people's homes if they mm -hmm. got a tip that, uh, you know, Joe has a book. I saw that, uh, you know, it's got a Russian language title on it. And they would literally wait till you and your wife weren't home. And then they'd go through your house. They'd catalog everything in there, go through your mail, everything. They'd keep a file mm -hmm. on you um, with everything being digital now. I mean, just the, the abuses are rife and, uh, you know, FISA, all that stuff's coming up for renewal. You know, it'll get renewed. Um, I got my, you know, pro forma letter from my congressman saying, oh, I understand your concerns and don't worry, I'm really looking out for your privacy. And, you know, but of course we need to extend it because you won't right. be safe. You won't be safe if we can't spy on you. And uh, <laughs> the, the whole fake China threat, that is really what it's going to be about. It's going to be about getting you to let them spend more money. I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, we're already so in debt and have so many unfunded liabilities that I tell people the national debt, that clock that you see, those 30 odd trillion dollars, like that is only the tip of the iceberg. The US government has written so many IOUs and taken so much money from taxpayers over the last 60, 70 years and just flushed it down the drain on militarism. That, that money is still all due. I feel like a hundred trillion dollars worth of unfunded liabilities that are coming. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is we're we're talking about a big squeeze here, and uh, especially with the higher interest rates, you know, are those going to be permanent? It's tough to say. We can maybe talk about that later in the context of trying to think about the world going forward. But certainly, the last thing that we want, the last thing we can afford, the last thing that Beijing can afford, the last thing the world can afford, is a war between the United States. And China, which is what it would come down to if the Hawks get their way. The Hawks so, on both sides. Uh, Joe, uh, admittedly, I, I feel like this book doesn't come as a surprise to me because we've had so many conversations about this, uh, both on the show and just outside of it as well. And, you know, for me, it, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. But maybe we could break this down for like the normies or new listeners, you know, folks that, that you know, might have consumed the kind of content that you just kind of roll your eyes at you know, about you know, dangerous China. Can we go through a few examples, especially the ones that you brought up in your book of like arguments, why China is a threat and like your ways to debunk them, kind of giving them a, a sneak preview of, of, of what's in the book there. Sure. Sure. Um, so let's see, what order do I tackle these in the book? I guess it's not really relevant what, what order I go in. Um, so, so I start with, with some problems in terms of Chinese power projection capabilities. If you simply look at a map, you can already start to see the problem. And if you pull up a topographical and political map, you can really start to see the problems. Mm -hmm. China is surrounded on all sides and the train is very difficult, very unfriendly. They can't really, uh, you know, move north at all because that's where Russia is. You know, Mongolia, that area was once part of China. There's a reason that you don't hear, uh, you know, the Chinese government talk about needing to retake that particular piece of China to, you know, reunify the country and stuff. It's because an independent Mongolia poses no security threat to China. And it would also, you know, really disrupt their relations with the Russians. And they, they actually want to get along with their neighbors. They would just, like most major powers, like to get along on their own terms mm. on certain critical issues. 
think Russia and Ukraine, for example, right? There was a there was a certain amount of independence that they would tolerate in a certain course that they simply wouldn't tolerate. And so the same thing is going on there with, you know, Taiwan, for example. Um, so uh, and in terms of trying to project power out into the Pacific Ocean, I mean, there, there is a whole chain. There are multiple chains of islands that are preventing them from having easy outward access to the Pacific Ocean. And China doesn't even have a serious blue water naval capability. And if China's economy continues to slow down, which there's there's every reason to believe that it will as it matures, to say nothing of the possibility of you know the financial problems of all the bad debt that is locked away, especially at the local government level, um, slowing Chinese growth even further, as Washington tries to decouple, tries to prevent uh, China's uh, you know continued growth. Uh, investors are just getting scared off. Businesses are just getting scared off. It was it was always going to be a very tenuous situation if Washington decided that they wanted uh, to rethink engagement, the Clintonian policy of real economic engagement, which was really an inherited policy. But it, it really they were the ones who really pushed for WTO membership and, and got that ball over the finish line there, um, handing it off to Bush the second. But um no, and, and in terms of China being the economic powerhouse that it has been, a lot of that was built on really low-hanging fruits, like one-off benefits of industrialization. They benefited from the incredible labor labor saving uh, savings to be had, but they're losing out on a lot of that, that manufacturing to countries like Vietnam, to India. That's going to continue. You just go to Walmart if you're, I don't know, just pick something up. Like it used to be everything was made in China that was in Walmart. Today you pick, you pick things up, you find all sorts of, of different things you wouldn't have thought before. It's interesting. Mm. It just happens. It's just way too much. a lot of made in Vietnam actually myself. Y- yes. Yes. And it's mm-hmm. just, it's just a function of, of wage differentials. That's all it was. And so, um, yeah, uh, China's population is dying off at an incredible rate, at an incredible rate. Even if you believe the official numbers, which there are reasons not to believe them, even if you believe the official numbers, China is already no longer the most populous state on Earth. And uh, this was a function, uh, eh, multiple multiple causes, but part of it was the, the CCP's own uh, policy of restricting uh, the birth rate of the Han Chinese mm-hmm. population. Mm-hmm. Yes. And now Xi Jinping tried to reverse it and say, well, now that we're all getting rich and happy and industrialized and urbanized, why don't you go ahead and have more kids? They don't <laughs> want to. They don't want to, though, because once you leave rural farming, subsistence type lifestyle, children cease to be an economic asset and they become an economic burden. Raising a child is expensive in China is no different. Uh, housing is very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, China has all sorts of internal problems. It's a very large country. They have lots of ethnic minorities that they need to keep down. There are lots of elites all in different parts of the country that the CCP needs to keep down, different you know, economic entities in Shanghai, et cetera, that they need to, to keep focused on suppressing and controlling. So the CCP is very busy, very busy mm-hmm. internally. Um, far too busy to really cause serious problems for, for the United States, even if they were keen on doing that. Now, where China, where where Beijing is serious, is about eventual reunification between Taiwan and the mainland, and what they have invested in is not a military force posture and structure that's capable of going anywhere, fighting anyone over anything at any time. It is not the defense guiding planet's you know full spectrum dominance. That's not what this is. What their military doctrine is based on is area denial. They Mm -hmm. want to be able, you know, if it really comes down to it, to have the standoff capability to keep the United States away from its shores. And they have that now. The southern coast, the southeast coast of China there, just ringed with missiles, tons of missiles. And they're cheap, a lot cheaper than an aircraft carrier, let me tell you. That's for damn sure. And there's just no question. There's no question. I mean... Uh, you know, you read you read military experts on this stuff. Even the most gung ho optimistic institutes now say that, well, you know, we could win, but it'd probably cost us, you know, half the air power that we have in the Pacific. You know, maybe a couple aircraft carriers. I mean, we're talking about losing Trillions. twenty, thirty thousand, <laughs> you know, Americans right. uh, 
in a conflict like this. And, and frankly, the more honest ones say, no, we would lose. We would lose. Uh, because we just we couldn't even get close. We couldn't even get close enough to do anything unless you were just betting that uh, Beijing would not let loose some of these, you know, carrier destroying missiles and sink one of them. And God forbid they did because American public opinion would freak out. And I just look at the Cuban Missile Crisis and how was that resolved? Well, Khrushchev was convinced behind the scenes to back down. And it was a quid pro quo that the U.S. would later remove its missiles, its Jupiter missiles, from Turkey. Right. But Kennedy told Khrushchev, actually it was Bobby told him, Kennedy told Bobby to tell him. But Bobby told the ambassador, listen, you tell anybody publicly that we're going to remove missiles for you somewhere else, deals off because it's an election year and we'll get crushed. Mm-hmm. I just think, and, and that, that move by Khrushchev, that led to him getting cooed out. That's what got Khrushchev removed from power. And I look at our own political leadership. I look at, you know, Xi Jinping. Is someone really going to back down in a situation like that? I mean, it seems obvious that it's the end for you if you if you if you do. And so I think the critical thing is never to allow it to reach that point. And, you know, I definitely understand, uh, you know, Taipei and the Taiwanese not wanting to get swallowed up by the mainland seeing what happened to Hong Kong, etc. You know, this 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 is just the policy that was decided on effectively, effectively, functionally 50 years ago. As soon as it was acknowledged that Beijing is the government of China and that Taiwan is part of China and that we're going to grant China, you know, most favored nation status, give them WTO status, transfer all this vital very important uh, military technology to China. Like this, this was always where it was going to end up. And so, you know, I, I understand that the Taiwanese government spends money lobbying, uh, you know, the U.S. think tank industry, the arms industry, U.S. Congress people. I understand that it's, it's a good investment for them to try and get the United States to stick around. But it's, it's just not in our interest. And if, if push comes to shove, I, I hate to think what's going to happen. So. Uh, it, there is a real threat to Taiwan, but Taiwan, last time I checked, is not part of the United States. And the people who try and say, well, U.S. credibility is on the line. U.S. credibility mm-hmm. seems to be on the line all the time. Right. It was everywhere, on the, line, all on the, the time. line everywhere all the time. And, you know, we've lost every single war since World War II, and it hasn't seemed to hurt us any. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'd be okay with it hurting us some. I mean, I, the the idea that we just need to keep adding commitments and adding commitments and never scale them back, even if we made the commitment sixty years ago and it you know no longer serves U.S. interests and it's no longer something we can carry out. You know, it just seems to me logical that we need to stand up and say no to this stuff. Well, it's also just really contradictory too, right? Like specifically with the China bit, you know, the fact that we have these, you know handshake agreements with Taiwan to to defend them or to arm them against China, but at the same time acknowledge, you know, uh, that that Beijing is the <laughs> is the ruler of 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 Taiwan, you know, there it feels like, you know, the the in the beginning of World War One, when, uh, you know, everyone had all these kind of contradictory, you know, alliance systems set up that, you know, one one match goes off and <laughs> we'll see where all the chips land, you know? I think World War One is, is exactly the right example. Uh, you know, the think tank world in Washington, they love to use Hitler. Everybody's Hitler. Mm-hmm. But that's not the right analogy. The right analogy here is World War One. And just to make clear to people who are listening, who because I know you guys have done some great World War One stuff, like, I just want to emphasize, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, <laughs> the heir to the throne, the Archduke, like, that was a totally peripheral yeah. irrelevant assassination like political figures leadership had been getting assassinated by terrorists in europe for decades yeah for decades <laughs> yeah. and it was the choices being made on the basis of calculations of strategic interests and alliance like that was a war of choice mm-hmm. that was a war of choice and it was they put themselves in a situation where that choice just kind of became automatic Everyone mm-hmm. following the logic of all the things that had happened before. Right. And the thing that's really scary is uh, the British, for example, because the British were seeking a pretext to get into the war. And they used a treaty that they had signed that said they would uphold 
or respect Belgian neutrality. This is what they use to get into the war because Germany swings their right their right wing through Belgium to get in behind the lines to drive at Paris. All that treaty really, really was saying was that all the powers involved swore to respect Belgium sovereignty, meaning that they would not themselves. So, so Germany, Britain wouldn't go to Belgium. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what (laughs) it was. But they spun it. Um, but Asquith was was presented with uh, the 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 uh, the first Sea Lord Fisher was his name. He basically came to him and said, "We've already made plans with the French general staff. So the decision of whether or not to go to war that's that's already been decided. Mm-hmm. Uh, the French are counting on us now to secure uh, you know the North Sea and the Channel ports because their fleet has been you know r- you know sent into the Mediterranean just as we had already agreed and planned." This wasn't something that the, that most of the liberal government even even knew the government, uh, let alone the public. It was never debated. So that's kind of what I fear going on here. Did was there any debate when U.S. trainers were put on Taiwan? U.S. military personnel are on Taiwan. Was was the, was there any public debate when the U.S. started having when Washington started having high level diplomatic contacts with Taiwan, even though that was expressly forbidden by the second communique, which was signed by the Carter administration? And which is the basis, along with the, the first communique signed by Nixon, so Republicans and Democrats together, this is a joint policy, they said that they were not going to have a military presence on Taiwan, that they were not going to have high-level level diplomatic contact with Taiwan. Arms sales were always a sticking point. That one's a tough one. There's, there's a third communique that dealt with that, and it's, it's tough to really gauge that one. I, I do think... I do think it, it, it is it is a potential for, for problems simply because of the way she uses Chinese nationalism domestically for his own purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, that seeing arms go to Taiwan, you know, it's just the optics of it are terrible. And, the, and Beijing has never liked it. And Xi Jinping is, is not some kind of autocratic, you know, godlike figure who can just do whatever he wants and, you know, opinion be damned. I mean, he has he has constituencies that he's going to have to answer to. They're, they might not be, you know, voting and, you know, going to the polls and stuff like that, but he has constituencies nonetheless, just as Khrushchev did. Mm-hmm. And, mm, you know, that, that whole blockade that, that happened, the simulated blockade after Pelosi's visit, I, I really thought that would jar more people uh, to see reason than it did. Uh, and instead, you know, the Tom Cottons carried the day, you know, that this just shows that Joe Biden is weak and we need to really stand up to the Chinese, Jesus. you know? Yeah. I mean, this, the same thing of course is going on now, you know, uh, in the middle East over the, uh, you know, the, the, the crisis with, with shipping, you know, mm-hmm. you've got John Bolton back in the paper saying, well, I told you we needed to blow up Iran and now man's look where still we alive. are. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, he just had a he just had an op the other day. They always they always give him space whenever he wants, and uh, because he speaks for uh, an institutionalized type of person, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who's bought and paid for by the arms industries, who only thinks in terms of power and domination and not in terms of cooperation, who sees every international uh, interaction in terms of you know strictly winners, strictly losers. Anything good that happens to anyone else comes at our expense. Um, and as uh, myself, being a small L liberal, I just that that kind of thinking is completely foreign to me. So, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry for how, veering off there. You know how no, that no, happens it's sometimes. It's exactly but, where I wanted it to go, if anything. <laughs> yeah, the, the John Bolton, the turd that won't flush. Um, <laughs> that's that's quite right. <laughs> uh, so, in terms of it. With Chinese history, you know, the thing I always try to bring up is that Chinese unification, you know, this big badass China that's super scary, this unified government is 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 the exception to it, but not really the rule in in Chinese history for most of its long history or for long parts of its long history, it was different states often warring with each other. 
um, you know, even as late as the, you know, the, the early 20th century, there was, China was ran by warlords um, before the, the state unified. So this, this um, unified state is really the exception, not the rule. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. From the terrifying power of tornadoes to sizzling summer temperatures, AccuWeather Daily brings you the top trending weather-related story of the day, every day of the week. You can learn a lot in just a few minutes. Stories that will impact you, such as how a particular hurricane may affect your area, or will that impending snow event bring more than just a winter wonderland? Occasionally, there are weather-related stories from the lighter side, like how a recent storm trapped tourists inside Agatha Christie's house, a setup perfect for a plot of one of her novels. And if there's a spectacular meteor shower or eclipse coming your way, we'll let you know if the sky in your area will be clear to check out the celestial display. You see, AccuWeather Daily is more than just weather. It's AccuWeather. Listen and subscribe to AccuWeather Daily wherever you get your podcasts. That's AccuWeather Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Certainly, uh, there, there, there have been, uh, gosh, Chinese history goes so far back. I actually, I actually teach a course on it and, uh, <laughs> I, I don't even try to run through all of the dynasties because there are so many, there's something like 70 different dynasties, depending on how you count. And even some of the major ones, you had, uh, you know, dynasties coexisting at the same time, ruling different parts of China, dominated by different types of ethnic groups. And so when, when I talk about, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese state, I, I'm, I'm usually thinking specifically about the Han Chinese, the Han Chinese. That's the heart and soul of, 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 of Chinese civilization. It's also what Chinese they want you culture. to think. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, and I mean, it's 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 certainly not been true that they were always in charge or that it was always unified in that way. Certainly mm-hmm. not. Um, some of the most uh, successful dynasties actually were not uh, ethnically Han Chinese at all. Uh, China doesn't reach, uh, you know, quote unquote China. I, I, I think Lucian Pai, who was a sinologist and political scientist, uh, oh gosh, I think he died, shoot, 20 years ago something like that but he he was writing back in the 50s 60s 70s he had said it's it's more useful to think of china as a civilization rather than a state because mm-hmm. it's it's territorial dimensions have changed uh the names of the dynasties and the the ethnic makeup of its ruling class has changed but the the continuity uh is in its bureaucratic form in its state system in its language and the qing the Qing, for example, the, the final dynasty uh, prior to the, the revolution in the early 20th century, which kicks off the uh, round of warlordism that uh, Henry was just mentioning, which is ultimate, which ultimately culminates. Well, I guess I shouldn't say culminates because the Civil War never ends. Um, I guess I'll get back to that in just a second. But essentially what you had was a series of foreign dynasties, uh, everything from the, the Mongol Yuan, who uh, descend following the breakup of, uh, it was part of the uh, the great uh, uh, the great Mongol Empire of the, the uh, 13th century, uh, part of which dominated uh, Russia, the, the Golden Horde, the Mongols mm-hmm. running wild everywhere, sacking Baghdad and, you know, ending the Islamic Golden Age there. Um but yeah, they, they adopt uh, Chinese characteristics. There's there's always a fusion. Uh, you know, it's it's not entirely one to one. They just adopt everything that's ethnically Han Chinese and are totally signified. But uh, the bureaucracy, the imperial bu- bureaucracy, is what kept that running. And the Qing, the uh, which they were Manchus, they were Manchus, which they were actually the descendants and, and vassals of. Uh, oh gosh, which which dynasty was that? Now the one of the songs, I believe it was. I don't have my my lecture in front of me here, and 
it gets kind of arcane and in the weeds, but they, they essentially, the Qing are the ones who take the dynasty, the, the Chinese state to its furthest territorial extent. And this is actually around the time that the American Revolution is kicking off, mm -hmm. uh, formally incorporating areas like Xinjiang, Taiwan, all of these areas. And this was around the time the, the Americans are fighting the British. Um, so yes, and, and of course, then that state uh, ultimately... Uh, is is undone by a series of of just tremendous internal upheavals um such as the type the 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 taiping rebellion and then the, the boxer rebellion and the foreign wars the opium wars that go on and there there are a lot of different <laughs> chinese history in the 19th century is really chaotic and then of course the the government ultimately falls in the early 20th century and uh, Sun Yat-sen, who has sort of a platform, an ideology, a vision for a republic in China, he lacks all of the things you actually need to make a state, which is money and armed men. And so he loses out to a series of military leaders who then, you know, these governors, they can't really get along. And so the country fragments. Ultimately, Chiang Kai-shek is, is able to assert control of most of it by the late 1920s in partnership with the communists, although he ultimately stabs them in the back and murders a bunch of them to try and get them out of the out of the way. Um, but that doesn't really work. And then they make a unified front against the Japanese who invade Manchuria and start trying to gobble up China, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, Mao and the communists wind up winning the war against the republicans uh there's been great books about that and if anyone i one time when i was on the show i don't remember if this is the last time i was on this before this but we talked about favorite historians barb tuckman who i had mentioned she has a great book called uh stillwell in china and it's a great book on this period and you know she's got a great way of doing narrative history uh she kind of illustrates many of the ways in which Chiang Kai-shek fails to consolidate power effectively, a lot of it due to corruption, inefficiency, just not wanting to actually decentralize and share power. Um, yeah, and, and, we, and they retreat to, to Taiwan, to Formosa. And actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. This is exactly what happened oh gosh, five, six centuries ago, you had this civil war and you had the remnants of the prior dynasty chased all the way off the mainland. They hold up on Formosa uh, and then were eventually uh, killed, uh, laid siege to and killed. And so it's just funny how history kind of repeats itself there. That's pretty much where we're at once again. So, But I guess when your history is a couple thousand years old, there's bound to be a few similarities. Yeah, a few echoes. Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, in, in this case, you know, five, six hundred years ago, Taiwan or Formosa, for that matter, wasn't producing vitally important chips for us. So I let's hope let's hope that the, that they don't lay siege and kill everybody because, uh, you know, I need me my sweet, sweet technology. Well, well Joe, let me <laughs> well, ask we've you been, We've been told well, we've been told by by U.S. planners that. And I, I provide all the evidence and documentation in the book, all my sources. The book is scrupulously sourced and cited, so you can go check the stuff out for yourself. But you have more than one U.S. defense policy and defense decision maker, multiple ones of them, saying flat out, if a blockade or invasion happened and we thought there was a chance of these chips falling into the hands of Beijing, we would blow up those facilities. Oh, my God. So, so we would blow them up ourselves? That the, that the U.S. government would blow them up sooner than uh, hand. They would Copenhagen them, you know. Oh, wait. Blow, wait, blow so, up what facilities? The, the chip making facilities. Oh, the chip facilities. Oh. Mm -hmm. that, would be some, yeah. that, would, that would be some wild shit. You know, something that... So they're, they're, they're trying to build domestic production facilities here in the United States so that when they eventually do that, if they do it, uh, you can still have your smartphone. Well... What do you so. what do you think is the likelihood? And I'll I'll give my first my two cents. I think one of the I hate forecasting and I hate making predictions because you know you can be wrong and then everyone could throw it in your face. Even if you're right about things, people don't remember when you're right. People remember when you make mistakes. So I hate making sweeping forecasts. But for the sake of entertainment, I think we're going to be doing. A Let's lot make of that some today. sweeping <laughs> forecasts. <laughs> sweeping, sweeping forecasts. <laughs> So I don't I don't think that China is going to invade Taiwan at least this in the 
foreseeable future, I, I would be really surprised. But the way I've been thinking about it is that, at least my perception is that, the big consequence in Taiwan is going to be the business environment in terms of a lot of because Taiwan and China are trading partners. I, uh, I mean, I, Taiwan is. China is Taiwan's greatest trading partner, if I'm correct. If not the, the biggest mm -hmm. trading partner, then I mean, you would know better than I would. But um, the there's biggest. a lot of business interest mm -hmm. between between Chinese companies and and Ty Taiwanese companies. I know there's Taiwanese companies that have like conglomerates in China. Um, what I feel what will happen is that. The U.S. may even put pressure on Taiwanese business to essentially choose like what they want to do. Like, do you want to continue doing business with the CCP or with Chinese companies or having you know holdings in China or international? You know, these this this uh, warm, cozy relationship with them, or um, do you want to potentially lose out on on you know U.S. benefits? Um, so that's where I think that's going to be kind of the immediate impact of, of, uh, the current level of tension. Um, wondering what you thought of that. Yes, I, I, I do think that there, there's a lot to be said for that. They are, they are Taiwan's biggest trading partner. Um, you know, ge geographically, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I in think, fact, I think they're much depends. Partners. They're not throwing spears at each other from across the ocean, you know what I mean? Like they're able to have civil business relationships. Like why, mm -hmm. why go to war? Yes. And I, and I, th I think it's, <clears throat> I think you're right in terms of the desire to be patient. They've been patient for many years. Um, of course, an amphibious uh, invasion to retake the Island, especially with the possibility of the United States intervening was perhaps something that made that less, uh, desirable an outcome, but I always point to Hong Kong. Hong Kong uh, was held by the British until the late 1990s, and really at, at any point prior to that, 30, 40 years prior to that, the People's Liberation Army could have just rolled in there and, and steamrolled whatever British presence there, there was. They didn't because they wanted to preserve the economic benefits of the arrangement that existed. And they wanted Hong Kong to be able to more or less function similarly going forward. Now, we can debate why that didn't happen. But in the case of Taiwan, again, the, the benefits to keeping the relationship the way it is are enormous. Messing with it would be very dangerous and very risky for everyone involved. And so I don't think anyone really wants to. And if you look at public polling data, and I, I just wrote an article on uh, Taiwan's upcoming election a couple weeks ago over at the Institute. I write, I write a weekly piece over there. Um, I've had to slow down recently with, with classes starting and doing lectures and stuff, but it was about the Taiwanese presidential election and how this is, look, e even the, the DPP, the, the, the pro, the quote unquote pro independence party or anti unification party, however you want to describe them, even their leading figures are not looking to court conflict. Um, and, and they couldn't be more clear about that. I mean, they've, they've been very clear about not wanting to be reunified, but they've also been clear that they in no way want conflict. And maybe the, those two things are probably maybe irreconcilably opposed to one another over the long term. But by all means, just kick the can down the road further. I mean, there's no harm in, continue, in things continuing the way that they are. And certainly, uh, from, uh, from the CCP's perspective, uh, from a leadership perspective, a failed invasion, uh, you know, that would, I'm not saying that Beijing, the, the governmental apparatus, the security bureaucracy, the military would give up or something like that. But, but any sorts of serious setbacks or failures would, would probably mean, mean the end of, of Xi Jinping. And there's been a lot of movement in the ranks, the upper levels of, of the PLA and the PLA Navy brass over the last year. 
And there's a lot of speculation. A lot of it's very opaque. It's hard to get a good read on what's going on in terms of why he's putting the people where they are, you know, so that they can be more loyal. You know, a lot of talk of anti-corruption. Certainly, there's there's been some very hawkish people put in charge there, but it's it's hard to see long term. I talked about our own, the United States's financial situation. Uh, it, it, it seems from my perspective as an economist, it's, it's very hard to see 50 years from now how the United States is going to be able to maintain the kind of serious deterrent force posture. If you even consider what we have now, a serious deterrent force posture, just given the, the, the fiscal impediments that are going to exist. Um, so it would seem to me that, that patience benefits everyone. The United States, because they because we, we need those chips for the time being, because we don't want to fight a war, because that would be terrible and destructive. Taiwan, because they are autonomous at this point. They have a great economic relationship with both uh, the mainland and the rest of the world. And they don't all want to die in a fiery inferno, which is, you know, what will happen if there is an actual shooting war there. They will be right smack in the middle of it. Uh, And then Beijing. I mean, you're getting all the benefits right now. You have the ability in an actual national emergency, I, I don't even know what that would look like. But if you decided for some reason, we just need to have total control of the waters surrounding us right now for some reason, it's not as though the U.S. could intervene. And it's not as though Taiwan has the ability to cause any serious trouble for them. So it seems to me like we should be encouraging everyone to accept the status quo, to maintain the status quo, to do as little as possible to disrupt the status quo as it's possible to do. Don't know where it'll go down the road, but I know that right now, any any attempt to resolve it would be terrible for everyone involved. And so no attempt should be made to move it at all. And the maintenance of the status quo uh, will take statesmanship, which is something the United States seriously lacks, because the last 30 years of unipolarity have seriously dulled the United States' what, what ability they had to conduct relations diplomatically without, uh, you know, resorting to military posturing or militarization or direct intervention. So it's going to be a challenge. But yeah, we're definitely out of practice on, on the diplomatic front, I think. Uh, you know, it, it's like the saying, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we've had the biggest hammer in the world, you know, for <laughs> 50 years or something like that, right? Probably more. And just, you know, we've been hammering the shit out of all the nails and it's the only way that we know yeah, how to fix and it, and it right solves now. and it solves so little yeah it solves so little and yet if you pick up foreign affairs or you pick up the corporate press you would think that it had been a miracle worker you'd think that we'd had nothing but raging successes our entire lives mm-hmm. no failures all the time uh it's it's imposing your will all the time and you go back and read uh, you know, more sober analysts back in the 40s, 50s, even 60s who just said, nope, can't fight a land war in Asia. Don't do it. Terrible idea. No, nope, we need to conserve money. No, nope, don't do this. Don't do that. No, nope, we need to cut a deal here. Cut a deal there. I mean, I just look at it like we had guys shaking hands with Stalin and Mao, the two greatest mass murderers of the last century. But the idea of shaking hands with Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping Right. is just out of the question mm-hmm. <laughs> how how is this possible how did we get to this point um uh, did it, did it and pat, again pat i think buchanan it's just the incentives speech. yeah pat buchanan wrote wrote um one of nixon's speeches uh you know praising mao and you know that it, it made him sick to his stomach <laughs> it's like pat <sighs> write write about write me something about um oh Mal being a nice guy. Mal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You, it's just it's just the cost of doing business. I mean, look at the United States now. Look how little diplomatic power and leverage the United States has at this point. They can't even get people to agree to help them do something like pressure a government to stop uh, you know, to prevent ships passing in and out of uh, you know, uh, a choke point. You know, to, to keep, uh, you know, the cost of oil down or something, which 
I mean, that's like the bare minimum that you would expect someone of apparently enormous global clout to be able to do. And yet they aren't able to. They aren't. Not only are they not able to prevent that government from doing what they're doing, they're not able to get anyone other than one other tiny little irrelevant country who is basically owned by the United States to even go along with it in anything other than a symbolic sort of, oh, yeah, we agree with Washington. Are you going to help? No, of course not. Of course we're not going to help. <laughs> right. You know we, what I mean? Like this is this is the end result. When, when you say, it was a bankrupt policy. When you say one small irrelevant country, do you mean Germany? Bahrain. <laughs> Bahrain. <laughs> Bahrain. Yeah. Which which basically that they only go along with it for, you know, uh, you know, the fact that well, gosh, going all the way back to what was it, two thousand two when George W. Bush decided that they were gonna be a major non NATO ally, they got that great status, and I, I just did this huge like data like data collection study. I'm working on this very large project about uh, U.S. aid and its relationship to human rights performance and political freedom and the likelihood of a coup and things of that nature, Bahrain just started getting money shoveled at them, just shoveled it. Not that they really needed it, but the U.S. started giving them all this, you know, be our friend scholarship money. And, you know, it's the home of the fleet there. And I mean, there's, there's really no question. I mean, Iran's right, Iran's right across the Gulf. They have territorial disputes. I mean, you know, so just no question they're they're in the u.s's pocket um you know they're one of the first to sign the abraham accords they, they made their decision and they, they've they're they've got nowhere else to go with it even if their own population hates them for it which it looks like they they increasingly do i was just reading something from the quincy institute about it the other day but uh yeah i mean that that's the extent of the u.s leverage that that's who you got to go along with your operation safeguard I don't even remember. What, what did they name this one? Guarantee Prosperity or Safeguard Prosperity? It's got one of those dumb I names, forget. yeah. <laughs> I forget <laughs> right? it. They always have these dumb names. So, yeah, that's 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 what the policy produced. And so, you know, uh, I read an article the other day showing that Americans are increasingly concerned about foreign policy. Uh, and this is an aberration going into an election year. Usually foreign policy struggles to crack the top 10, no matter what's going on mm-hmm. really outside of like, you know, World War II or something. And then public polling data was so, so new, it's hard to know. But, uh, you know, with peak Vietnam, but really most of the time, it's, it's all bread and butter, domestic stuff, uh, social issues. The alarming thing, though, is the number of Americans who seem to believe that someone like Nikki Haley is the solution that that we're lacking, <laughs> that Joe Biden and his guys are too weak, and that Trump he's just you know too weak, you know, uh, it's it's incredible to me that they think the answer is to return to the type of person who is going to embrace the same exact pot like these same verbatim policies that we've been pursuing, and that that's the answer. But again, it's because of the domination of the narrative um, by that group for so long. I mean, it's, it's what you you are, what you eat. And the average American who is, quote unquote, informed generally reads a lot of the corporate press, a lot of the sort of mainstream books that you find on the bookshelves that tell you, you know, Iran is out to destroy the United States somehow. Uh, you know, the U.S. is kept safe by sanctioning Venezuela till everyone leaves the country, you know, need to fight China over Taiwan. Uh, Ukraine is vital to America's national interests. I mean, this is the kind of stuff they read. So what do you expect them to, to think? So it's very tough to try and change that narrative. But I'm often reminded that the British and the French did not abandon global empire until they absolutely had to until they were literally forced to well by the hard brick wall of reality and i'm afraid that's what it's going to take us running into and hopefully it just won't be too damaging yeah um well with with the current wars that are that are active they've taken over like a pretty partisan dynamic um so when you look at ukraine which the u.s is a party in the war it's it's fighting russia through proxy using ukraine as a proxy and just looking at the partisan lines between it because i'm not sure if most republicans i 
you know, I don't trust a lot of polling data I see, but at this point, I think the majority of Republican voters are, you know, not in favor of funding Ukraine. There's there's popular Republican politicians who are like, no more, bo-. I mean, even Lindsey Graham is saying that, you know, the funding of Ukraine needs to stop. And this is Mr. 2017 will be the year of offense. Um, <laughs> you know, offense. <laughs> this will, 2017 will be the year of offense. Um, the the majority of the support for the Ukraine war, or for support or funding Ukraine, to, uh, the fight Russia, came from liberal Democrats, and I think there's a whole domestic issue where a lot of liberal Democrats were projecting their domestic enemies onto Russia, and that's why they were so favor. And of course, there's just always that. You know, if it's your guy running the war, there, there's going to be more support for it. I don't know how principled the Republican stance was against against um, or the right wing stance was was against um, you know funding Ukraine. I mean, also there is that the majority the majority of Republican politicians were in favor of it. So uh, I'm just talking about the Republican voter base. Um, but now you have the opposite, really, with the war in Israel, where the majority of Democrats are against funding funding Israel, and the majority of Republicans are favoring Israel in, in the war on Gaza. So these conflicts, they take a complete partisan dynamic, and they just never seem to even be a principal stand uh, one way or another for or against them. Yes, and I, I do think it's important to note that the majority of politicians on both sides do support all of these conflicts yeah. continuing and support the U.S.'s role in them. So that's that's the first thing to sort of keep front and center. There is still, there, there have always been dissenters, prominent dissenters to American policy. But over the last 70 years, they've been overridden every single time. And when they've won the argument, it's been long past the point that it was even relevant. So many people had died, so much money had been spent. You know what we were even getting involved in fighting for was completely obscured by that point. It was just it was irrelevant. They weren't even really right in a way that mattered. No one really acknowledged or had to acknowledge that that it was a, a mistake. You know, um, I look at it now, and now that you know things in Ukraine just didn't go the way that they promised they would, the narrative is now that well. It would have gone the way we told you it was going to go if we had just given them our entire arsenal, like we told you to. You well, know, Joe, they're it's, declaring it's not they're that declare we were victory there. Wrong. That's the strategy is to, to declare victory and just walk away. Are we going to be on the aircraft carrier again with the big? Th- no, there's sign? already. So basically, <laughs> the narrative that's being constructed right now, and you could see it, is that hey, listen, like we've done everything that we possibly can for Ukraine and we stop them from invading Russia up uh, from the rest of Europe. Ukraine as is, is the bulwark for Western civilization for liberal values. And, you know, realistically, I don't know how much territory the Russians are going to take more um, th- than what they have already annexed. Um, you know, they could go as far as the Dnieper river. They haven't yet. And, you know, from what I've read, the Ukrainian army is still has the capability to fight and to defend territory. Um, they just don't well, have the ability 16 to, soon too, so to that take change. For, for everything. But from what I'm reading, and, and I haven't been following the military situation like I used to, but is that they have the ability to kind of hold the line and, and keep Russia from completely invading the rest of Ukraine um, and making it very hard to even get up to, to the Dnieper. However, there's no way that they can take any land back. Like they're just completely in a defensive positions and and the only thing they could really do is hope is is negotiate a peace by giving up land um so let's just say if if you know russia remains with their remaining annexed territories um or the territory that they already have and they, they sue for some sort of peace where ukraine promises not to join nato or or they make considerable cuts to you know, their military spending or whatever. I don't know what a peace would, would look like. Um, the U.S. would just say, well, we won this war, obviously, because 
we prevented the Russians from crossing into Poland and then crossing into Germany and then crossing into the rest of Europe and making some Orthodox Christian dictatorship with, with Putin at the head um, or however they'd want to spend it. Some, some Soviet Union 2.0 type thing. Um, that's going to be the narrative. And they're going to say it was successful. This was a successful and no, and everyone is going to try to save face. Yes, it is. It is surprising that <laughs> it is surprising that uh, they're even. Dr- I mean, I'm just. I'm always so galled by by the efforts of of the architects of these policies to so blatantly change the goal, just move the goalposts, and declare victory when this is a totally unacceptable outcome yeah. uh, from the very beginning. And I'm someone. And I'm someone who was writing in the months leading up to the invasion that this is a terrible idea. And if, if it comes to a military solution, Russia's going to win. Mm-hmm. I, I was surprised how long it took, but there, there was never any question that, that Ukraine was going to win and, and push Russia out of the parts of Ukraine that it occupied. And, and it always seemed to me that the best thing possible would be Finlandization. And for those of you who are not aware, for those listeners who are not aware, like this was Finland taking on neutral status during the Cold War and allowing the Soviets a port in Finland, which was essentially the situation that already existed in Ukraine, which was it would be a neutral state with Russia having a very prominent naval facility there. Um, and instead we got we got this. I mean, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I could see, I could see like a part of the deal being like a rump Ukraine that does get to join NATO, uh, you know, in a similar way to like rump, rump West Germany got to join NATO, um, just because they're, you know, I don't know. What are they going to put up more the jobs for the more jobs huh. for the bureaucrats? You know, easier weapons sales. I mean, Washington's going to continue to sell them weapons anyway, probably. Uh, I don't know. I'm sh- I'm sh- I'm sure that that will be part of whatever negotiation happens. I'm still waiting to hear exactly what Washington's planning because we keep hearing things behind the scenes that, well, Washington's encouraging them to negotiate, but then you look at what Zelensky's saying, and he's saying, no, I'll never negotiate. And you read stuff about he and his military brass who are clashing and you know finding bugs in his office and stuff. So I mean, it's it's a total disaster, and. I don't know. It's it's just such a tragedy, and uh, gosh, Russia was was really no threat to Europe ever. I mean, and there was always this odd tension in the narrative that was Ukraine is winning, and they're just about to push Russia into Russia's territory, and also Russia sees so weak. Don't worry about us arming them, but also Russia is about to invade Poland and Germany and destroy all of Europe. There was always this very weird dissonance in the narrative that. You couldn't get anyone to to really answer who was in any kind of prominent position to talk about it, um, even though it was perfectly obvious to any ordinary person listening to to the dialogue that was that was taking place. And now, now what? I mean, yes, you're right. It, it was it was a, a project favored uh, by Democrats, generally speaking. Um, it was begun under Democratic administrations for the most part. But I think it's worth remembering that it was really the George W. Bush administration that really started all of these problems by basically saying, yes, eventually Ukraine will be part of NATO. And then not taking the hint when Georgia, who had been also part of that 2007 meeting, NATO summit, where they said that, got smacked very hard by the Russians right in the immediate aftermath of that. That should have been a signal of what was going to happen. But you have essentially the same people in charge. I mean, the the people who run the State Department and the DIA and all that stuff, they, they don't they don't move in and out of their office when presidents come and go. I mean, it's all the same people, literally the same people. Um, some of the top people even served in multiple administrations in various roles. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's it's been a terrible scandal, a terrible scandal. And I, I do wonder how much of that is going to come back on us like this. There must be some kind of blowback. I mean, some Ukrainians must realize they've been used treacherously, uh, you know, and the place has just been flooded with arms. And I just wonder whether or not you're going to see some kind of blowback. Um, 
because they're going to feel very abandoned, obviously, um, because they were never given anything close to what it would take to push the Russians out. I mean, if you even think that was possible, I mean, it was, it, they, they were always getting handed, you know, 22 rounds to go fight someone with a, a howitzer, you know, and just getting ground to pieces and, you know. Well, uh, I'll, I'll challenge that just only slightly. I, I generally agree with you, uh, Joseph, but, but I think if there was a success here, a U.S. success, it was in just wasting the money and the blood of the Russian war machine. And that was very effective. And, and, and I, I disagree with the characterization of giving them a, you know, a, a, <laughs> like a handgun for a howitzer fight, you know. It's more like a super old howitzer with not enough bullets <laughs> yeah. against a okay. new howitzer yeah. with sure. plenty of bullets, right? Uh, I think sure, that's, I'll take that. That's more of the matchup that we saw here because... Because, you know, I mean, like you admitted uh, just a few minutes earlier, you know, you were surprised at how long it took Russia to roll over. You know, I was thinking about it like, oh, yeah, they're going to fucking just absolutely stomp them. But then we come to find out that, you know, Ukrainians are actually pretty tenacious, you know, pretty hard fighters. And with enough arms from the West, you know, they, they were able to hold off wave upon wave upon wave. I mean, we were talking about like, this is what, three years on now, I think, right? We're coming up on yeah, three 2022, years. Twenty twenty two, yeah, yeah, uh, two years then, right? Yeah. E- either way, any number of years, right? Above one years was already longer than I think everyone's expectations on how long this this conflict would last. So, so if there was any successes, um, that that would be it. Um, I don't even consider that a that a, that a success though, because the cost that it came at was destroying any hope for. A constructive relationship sure, sure. between, I'm Europe, being between Europe and Russia. So the opportunity cost surely must outweigh it. I mean, the, the, the total militarization and radicalization of Russian society. I mean, this has given the, the secure the security apparatus mm-hmm. all the more power. I mean, it's 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 totally ruined East West relations there for, you know, yeah. probably the next generation. At least it pushed it finished pushing Russia and China together, even though that was a dumb strategy. If that if that was the strategy, I don't even know if they thought about it like that, but that was just dumb. Right. Um, didn't help America, you know, and then they they would crow about guys. Look, all that money that's going to, you know, quote unquote, Ukraine. Really, that's staying in America and going to the arms manufacturers here. So that's really it's all a plus. It's killing a bunch of Russians Shit. and we're keeping most of our money here anyway. Come on. Come I on, mean, guys. They, they've depleted deal. their strategic, you know, arms. I mean, now now we're hearing reports about uh, uh, Russia using. Uh, uh, artillery and, and rockets from from North Korea. That yeah, were yeah, I read from about North that. Korea, which is which is pretty interesting. So you know that again, I'm being like I don't think this is an actual success for the world or for anyone except for maybe the arms industries or or you know the 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 the, the war hawks that just want to keep our adversaries you know uh, uh, weak. Um, so in that case, well, Danny, I'll push back on that because the Russian military industrial complex is fully is fully kicked in right now over the past couple of weeks there's been some of the largest missile barrages in the in the entire war so they're sure. making i've they're actually making heard those, that they you go ahead sorry no they're 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 producing weapons and ammunition um at an extremely fast rate still and of course they're going to be buying stuff from north korea because why not they're buying stuff from iran but i mean it's they're they're stockpiling whatever they can get as much as they they get, I mean, they're still they're still trying to wrap up a war right now. As it as it relates to the uh, the the largest barrages, I've, I've actually heard that they've that they've been stockpiling those barrages. So, like, basically being very careful and, and calculated about when they use their their artillery and when they use their their um, their cruise missiles and their uh, ballistic missiles on purpose so that they can do large barrages like these. So, I don't necessarily think that that's indicative of a ramp up of production. Uh, and, and a lot of the other uh, things that I've read about, like, you know, just electronics, their uh, capability to, like, get chips. <laughs> we were talking about chips earlier. You know, chips did, like, you know, control of the, 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 the missiles themselves. Like, they're, they're having some trouble. They're not, they're not in a good spot right now. Their production might be ramping up out of necessity, right? But their stockpiles are depleted. Even their, like, you know, uh, uh, 
their Cold War stockpiles are depleted, <laughs> you know, and now they're they're going so far as to to outsource a lot of their 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 munitions, specifically well, Iran. Well, and well now here's we're here's hearing here's about North Korea. Here's the problem I think with this conversation, and I think this conversation is is actually um, kind of mimicked in the mainstream press because all you hear is about the munitions mm-hmm. and how many tanks have, have lost, how many armored vehicles were destroyed, mm-hmm. how many missiles you know each side has left. No one talks about how many people died. Right. right. <laughs> like, just like they're just equipment too. So all these Ukrainian guys, because let's just be honest, man, we don't really know the number of Ukrainian soldiers who died. We don't really know the right. number of Russian soldiers who died. All the numbers that, that right. are coming out are just completely unverifiable and untrustworthy from both sides. You know, the Russians and, and you know, I'll, I'll listen to some Russian commentators or some, some, some uh, commentators who are um, either very sympathetic to the Russians or they're just, you know, they they hate American foreign policy and they'll act as propagandists to to subvert it or to to uh, you know to, to hurt it in, in the press will say things like, you know, the Ukrainians have lost five hundred thousand soldiers or dead. I don't think that's true. I think that number is insane because when you we're talking about World War II level casualties, and if you actually look at the battlefront, there's not that much line. There, there's not. This isn't Operation Bar- Barbarossa or something. You know what I mean? Like this isn't. Um, we're, we're talking about a couple hundred miles. We're not talking about you know hundreds and hundreds of miles of of fighting. Um, and if they lost five hundred thousand dead then you would have to expect there'd be over a million people with life altering wounds. And there'd be no way that you'd be able to get away with that without the stories of just hospital outflow and in countries like Poland or other kind of Baltic countries who have to take in and and kind of deal with the the stress of Ukrainian wounded. Um, You're not seeing that too much, which makes me believe that those super high casualty numbers are are complete bullshit. But then you also hear super high casualty numbers on the Russians. Like, oh, well, the Russians lost half a million soldiers. I don't buy that either. Like, I I think it's, I don't want to make a casualty prediction, but um, I just think these large figures are overblown. However, I think they're both still terrible. Like, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides, at the very least. And um, it's um, no one. No one is really factoring in the loss of loss of human life in this in this conflict. Like it cost. Let's just say if a hundred thousand Ukrainians died and fifty thousand Russians died, like that was worth it for the, all this. Like that was wor- that was. I mean, I guess if you talk to our State Department or, or people making foreign policy in our country, they would say, yeah, fifty thousand Russians dead. That's fine with us. But like. You're gonna throw away a hundred thousand dead Ukrainians. Is that's just that's an acceptable outcome? Like, like an entire generation it's, it's of young not. men died. You killed an entire generation of young men, and there's not that a lot. A lot of the 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 people who uh, a lot of people left Ukraine before the war started, so they had already had a limited. Pool of how many people they could draft. That's why you're seeing like these crazy videos of of them like yanking people out of the street and throwing them into the lines. Um, you know that's why you're finding guys who are like 65 years old fighting in the Ukrainian army um, because just there's not there's such a there's a limited pool of people to like young people to, to take. Um, so you just have to think that this this society is going to be completely destroyed and uh it's just it's just incredibly sad like that whole region's history is just it's just kind of a heartbreaking like the the bloodlands of ukraine of world war ii um just the the you know the horrible starvations and 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 you know prior to world war ii that took place there i mean it might be the bloodiest place or one of the bloodiest places in human history the region of, of of the you know the Ukraine 
you know, the, the borderlands of Russia. Um, just absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, could you, Joe, could you, just a historical perspective, like, do you think, is, is the Ukraine the, one of the most bloodiest regions in human history? Well, the Eastern Front, yeah, uh, the Eastern Fronts in, in World War II in particular, was the lion's share of the casualties. Although I would point out that China, for example, you look at some of the estimates for casualties that they suffered in their various conflicts over the last 200 years, you're hard pressed to find serious conflicts that saw fewer than, you know, six, seven, eight million killed, as many as like 25, 30 million killed. So, I mean, we're, we're talking just un- unspeakable levels of destruction, uh, just uh, far larger populations, uh, you know, th- than what there was. That's not to say that, you know, the Eastern Front in World War II was not horrific and, you know, 30 million people died. And for that specific window of time, almost certainly, even though there was tremendous carnage taking place uh, in China, the rolling multi-front, you know, multi-decade civil war slash second Sino-Japanese war. I mean, it's all horrible. It's all horrible. Um, one of the things that you just mentioned, though, and I'm, I'm sorry to jump jump subject slightly here, and if you want to come back to this, I'm totally happy with that, was the idea of what what was this for? And the, the whole I, the whole reason that had been given for the war was to protect, uh, you know, a liberal democratic Ukraine to be part of a you know integrated liberal democratic Europe, right? The European project. Um, War does not make for liberal societies. Um, Neutrality did not make Finland into what Ukraine is now and is going to be in the future. Right? Ukraine is no one's definition of a liberal democratic society today. It was already not great prior to the conflict in terms of if, obviously, if you compared them to, you know... Central African Republic or something, yes, Ukraine doing great. But if you compared them to like Germany or someplace like that, not great, right? Um, It feels really good to be productive, but a lot of the time it's easier said than done, especially when you need to make time to learn about productivity so you can actually, you know, be productive. But you can start your morning off right and be ready to get stuff done in just a few minutes with the Inc. Productivity Tip of the Day podcast. You'll hear advice on everything from how to build confidence to how to get the best night's sleep. New episodes drop every weekday, and each one is five minutes or less, so you only have to listen a little to get a lot more out of your weekdays. Listen and subscribe to Inc. Productivity Tip of the Day wherever you get your podcasts. That's Inc. Productivity Tip of the Day wherever you get your podcasts. Serial killers, strange disappearances, unexplained mysteries, terrible disasters. I'm Nate Hale, and in my show The Conspirators, I'm here to tell you all the stories from history your teacher never told you about. Hear the real story behind the Bermuda Triangle, or about the history of people drinking blood to stay young, or about the serial killer operating in Nazi-occupied Paris, or what dark secret lurked within the walls of a Scottish castle. In my show The Conspirators, I take you on a journey through some of the darkest corners of history where you'll hear about the folklore, myths, and misconceptions behind some of the darkest events that ever happened. Listen to The Conspirators on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, sometimes the truth really is stranger than fiction. A unified Europe. Um, this is not something that the United States government has ever been super keen on and was only ever supportive of it on very, very certain terms. And one of them was that the Russians were not going to play a significant role, certainly not a military role, and that the Europeans, they were not going to play an independent military role, and that NATO, which Washington runs, was going to be the blocks, the European Union's By military course wing. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a reason that economic integration and political integration 
that military integration and the, the the creation of a you know a serious European armed force like that never happened. Um, just like you talked about uh, the Russians building up their 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 military industrial base, I have read similar things. I, I don't know exactly how much they're producing now, but I do know from having been in Europe, been around Europe and looking at the numbers and stuff like Europe is not an industrial powerhouse. This is not a hundred years ago. Like Europe is not an industrial powerhouse. They are reliant on the United States for their armaments overwhelmingly. It's just, it's such a tragedy. You read about, you know, the Germans say, ah, we'll get you this many tanks. And they've got like two, you know, how many, how many can they produce annually? You know, a similar number. The capacity is just not there because the European Union was not really envisioned or and it certainly did not develop as a geopolitical force. It was a geoeconomic project that imagined a different kind of world than the old type of world where war was the final arbiter of all questions. And so I really feel like this war is a tragedy for the European project because if they had been willing to to buck Washington and say, forget you, we're willing to say that, A, Georgia, Georgia, the, the, the state of Georgia, part of Europe, my, my, that's, that's quite incredible. I mean, and Ukraine, okay, Ukraine is going to be neutral and there's going to be some level of competition there, maybe some east-west facing ties, similar situation to how Taiwan is now. You're telling me that that was a was an unacceptable outcome compared to what we have now? No, I mean part of this, the reason that people like Ted Cruz supported this from the very beginning is because his constituents, his donors, his corporate backers, they wanted to be the ones selling Europe its oil and natural gas, not the Russians. Mm-hmm. And the idea of Russia serving as the European Union's gas station would have seriously diminished Washington's leverage over them. It's why they always hated those pipelines and always fought those projects. And this is going all the way back to, uh, you know, Willy Brandt's Austpolitik back in the 70s. There's the American Hawks have always hated the idea of specifically Germany and Russia cooperating. And they've done everything possible to defeat Uh, any kind of cooperation like that, because Washington likes having Europe in its back pocket. And I just think it's a terrible tragedy because uh, I am something of a Europhile. Um, My wife's Italian. And uh, so, yeah, I I just I look at Ukraine specifically. I I mean, it's 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 a total disaster now, and it's going to be a disaster for the foreseeable decades to come. Totally illiberal. You know, you look at their press laws, their the state of their democracy. And I know it's a war, but the United States held elections during wartime, including a civil war. I mean, the fact of the matter is Ukraine was not a thriving democracy, uh, liberal society to begin with, and that they could have made better progress towards being one had they simply ignored the hawks, pushed back against that and said, no, we are going to seek an accommodation with Russia. Accommodation became a bad word because it became associated with appeasement. And really, accommodation was the foundation of all foreign policy prior to Hitler and that becoming a dirty word. It was understood that major powers needed to respect the security uh, interests of one another when it came to certain key areas. And so uh, I just I wrote an article for a journal last year about it that Washington just that our leaders and our thinkers, they've never had to play in a playground like that. They're used to either having it their way or the highway. And if they don't get what they want, they're going to starve your civilian population into submission and maybe eventually bomb you to death. That's just not possible when you're dealing with China or Russia or even a country like Iran. And you just you have to be able to to seek pragmatic uh, engagement with them while acknowledging that we don't agree on every single policy. And that doesn't mean you love the Iranian regime or the Chinese regime or the Russian regime. I don't. I don't love our own regime. But like you just have to seek an accommodation with all of these with all of these different competing interests and factions. Otherwise, there's going to be serious trouble. 
trouble that we frankly can't afford. We have plenty of our own problems. To hear people talk, I, I thought it was very telling uh, when Mike Pence thought he, for a second that he might actually become president. And he was confronted about the state of America. And why are we sending, you know, billion upon billions upon billions over to Ukraine when a couple billion dollars would work miracles in a place like Detroit? And he basically just runs off like, yeah, that's just a talking point that you have. No, it's serious. And if you've actually been to these places that have been hit by deindustrialization or the opioid e epidemic or any of those things, you'd realize that America is not some thriving, amazing, winning community all over the place. No, no. Uh, the empire has left us poor and disillusioned and policies like the drug war and deindustrialization, like this has all been bad for the country. And, uh, you know, you look at the, the situation at the southern border, which I'm, I'm by no means like some kind of immigration alarmist or anything, but something has to be done. <laughs> something has to be done to fix this problem. Um, but it's just, you know, it's ignored. So if you if you look at some places in the Rust Belt, like. In, in in northern Ohio or or, or Cleveland, like Gary Gary Indiana, mm -hmm. um, man, these places look like Ukraine. <laughs> like they look like cities that just fought, just were just bombed by Russia. Like they're, um, they're they're they are poor. Um, there's some poor pockets that people don't even realize that exists in this country. Just go on any long road trip. You know, you're bound to find one by accident. Um, but it's it's just it's just crazy that like we we were all talking about it. You know, we're all American citizens who who are concerned. Um, but just the incentives to go along with these crazy foreign policy escapades are so strong once you get into a position of power. Um, these people just just cannot resist it, and we look at it yes, like they're, crazy. They're, yeah, yeah. No, there's there's every incentive for them to go along with it because if you refuse to, I mean, it's it's going to be the shortest tenure you ever had. Yeah, uh, the the benefits to going along with it are immediate and obvious, and fighting against it is probably just going to cost you your job. Um, even people who, you know, people hold up people like Bernie Sanders or Matt Gates, like they're some kind of champion of some alternate way of viewing the world. They're not. Just look at their voting records. They make a couple of statements that are like, we somewhat object to this aspect of the policy. And the reason you hear about it is because it's so outrageous and singular that anyone should defy Washington orthodoxy on this that they just have to get the press for that. But they don't actually cast meaningful votes or meaningfully change the discussion. They still vote for NATO expansion. They still vote for the F-35 program. They still vote for every military appropriation, support every dumb policy. Uh, it's and so and, and it's because of that. It's because of the immediate incentive for that. Um, and like I said, even when Americans are getting concerned about foreign policy, it's because they've been told we're too weak. We're too weak. And you talk about the different parties having the different concerns and stuff. Sure, like on the one hand, you have um, Democrats who, uh, you know, uh, are dominant in cities, which are very multi-ethnic, who have a lot of ties to places like Europe, who have value systems that are, you know, more in line with the European Union, which are very opposed to the sort of more, uh, let's say, Christian traditional values of uh, Russia, which they try and advertise, et cetera, et cetera. And so, of course, it's very natural for you to perform this way, just like Rashid Tlaib. People say, oh, my God, how can Sam say this? Have you ever been to Dearborn, Michigan? If she didn't get up and say the things that she says, she would not be the representative of, De of the people of Dearborn, Michigan, right. this overwhelmingly Muslim community. The same with, uh, you know, Republicans getting up in arms about Israel. Yes, it's because the Christian evangelical vote has very odd views about Israel for reasons of eschatology and other things. So, like, if you look at the domestic politics of it, one of our very first conversations was about Justin Romano and that great line that he has about understanding foreign policy as a function, a direct function of domestic policy within the empire. And that's exactly how you explain all of these things. And so... It's very frustrating to uh, be someone who disagrees with these orthodoxies and who seems to think that the merit of policies uh, and their continued pursuit should be the results of those policies that we can see. Um, but here we are. Well, you know, just just uh, 
just to go piggyback on what you were saying that when Americans are concerned, it's because they think we're too weak. The big one of the big alarms was the Afghanistan pullout, and the reason why it shook so many people is because of how embarrassing it was. It was like, oh my God, we've been in here for twenty years, and we're leaving like this. Man, this is a national embarrassment. Like we just lost to the, you know, essentially the Sand People from Star Wars. Um, mm-hmm. It's not to be derogatory, right here. You know what I mean, like prim. People, backward people from the mountains. Um, people that don't field aircraft carriers. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. How about that? don't feel, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what, that's the terminology we'll use whenever we refer to someone from a, you know, the global An south emerging, or something. Yeah, emerging exactly. frontier markets. Yeah. People who don't field right. aircraft carriers. Um, but the American people had been sold. But like you said, we declare victory and leave. The American people don't realize that that's just performative. They actually think we won. I remember the troops pulled out, right? Immediately the government falls. My wife comes to me you know, in the hours after this happened. We're literally listening to it happen on the radio. I've got, got a live stream going of it. And she goes, well, what happened? I thought we won. I thought they had this whole big army and stuff. And, it's like, and my wife is not an ill-informed person. She is a quote-unquote very informed person. And the, the quote unquote very informed person had been told repeatedly, like, "There's a great government we've built, invested lots of money there, trillions of dollars. They do a it's lot a of women's plus, rights great there. Army, tons of women's rights. It's going to be great. It's going to." And they got rid of the corruption, and they're going to deal with the drugs, and we built this great army, and it's all just going to be totally fine and dandy. And uh, you know, darn it, the the Kabul government didn't even have the decency to hold out for you know eighteen months or something like the South Vietnamese did, so that Washington didn't immediately look bad, because it really baffled the American people. You know, it really broke through the looking glass for a minute. You know, at least in Vietnam, Kissinger was able to buy enough time to, for where when the government, when the U.S. puppet government that they abandoned did fall, they were able to say, well, well, you know, that, this, that, and six other things, nothing, nothing we could do about it. You guys wanted us to come home, you know? No, this was, you know, declare victory and leave. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's difficult because even the, even the wars that they say that we won and did a great job on, like... When you really put them under the microscope, that none of that narrative holds up. The Bosnia conflicts and whatnot, which that's been in the news lately. Um, yeah, it's it's baffling. And, you know, we've talked about this before. Like, I, the reason that I care so passionately about this stuff is, I mean, apart from any moral questions and whatnot, is I have five kids. They're going to inherit all of this. Like, this country, this world, this is, this is their inheritance. And... Abraham Lincoln had this great quote about, uh, you know, will all the armies of Europe and Asia, you know, could they step the Atlantic and Pacific and strike us down at a blow? Never, never. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. And we're literally just dying by suicide. And it's just <laughs> it's the most obvious option, yeah. is the most obvious thing to watch. And we just keep doing it over and over until what is there going to be left uh, you know well so i uh so, i have an interesting thing that I, I think i can tie together a lot of the topics that we've talked about today i think this would be a fun way to, to discussion to wrap this up so this is going to touch on china this is going to touch on our prospectus for hot spots in 2024 and beyond and this is also going to touch a little bit on that last comment that you just made death by suicide are you familiar with a U.S. military initiative called the Replicator Initiative. No. Okay. Nope. All right. So let me, let me tell you guys about this. This is a U.S. Department of Defense effort to enhance our uh, capabilities to respond to China's military advancements, in particular their ship-killing missiles and their growing naval capa- uh, capacity. And what this replicator initiative, it, it's, it's a, it's reminiscent of Star Trek's replicator. If you're a Star Trek fan, if you watched it, it's the thing that like, you know, creates stuff, yes. right? This is magic oh, yeah. fucking tool. It just makes anything Trekkie. more, right? Um, TNG. <laughs> so, so the replicator initiative aims to deploy thousands of autonomous systems across a bunch of different domains, air, sea, and land. Get this 
within the next 18 to 24 months. And the article that I'm referencing here was written in August of this year. So we're talking about the end of 2024. We should be, we should have thousands of autonomous AI driven death machines <laughs> that are ready to kill China or at least be a bull worth to China. So let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about that for a minute. Um, Seems like, in my opinion, we're basically creating Skynet. If I, ch- I mean, for for those who are, who are not watching, because this isn't going to be on YouTube, Joseph Solis Mullen right now is is just speechless and he's just shaking his head right now. He's he's no, he's a no. <laughs> this is a thing, by the way. If you want, I'll send you the uh, the direct from uh, direct from the, uh, the Department of Defense like article on this yeah yeah go ahead and send it to me i had i had heard <laughs> you know talk of you know deploying like you know autonomous weapons drones and stuff and using like drone cloud attacks mm-hmm. to you know attack land-based chinese missile forces this was going back gosh i don't know, a couple of years ago but no i i missed the memo that they were actually are or it's a, no it's an pursuing R. it's it's within 18 to 24 months and and i'm looking at this is from from august of 23 so we're looking at you know and that's just crazy i mean the idea of uh, man the idea of like we we don't even understand the 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 systems yet and we're just gonna (laughs) and of course we're gonna weaponize them immediately and you know this public information so beijing is and you just wind up with this dumb arms race of this technology Mm -hmm. that oh man I mean, God, I think, I think so the use of, the, see, a couple of years ago when we started talking about this, the use of like swarm drone technology was like, all right, yeah, cool. That makes sense, right? Like, of course, you're going to, you know, that's cheap. They're in this replicator, you know, uh, initiative. We're just basically make a bunch of cheap, effective weapons, do what the terrorists do, basically, right? And and just, uh, we have giant production capability, right? We can, we can outmake tiny, you know, less sub $500 munitions that that are you know just basically drones with bombs on them right we can do that for days for for you know for decades right we can out outperform everyone in that but the, the idea when we were thinking about it a few years ago was always some human being is going to be back there like you know with an xbox controller piloting one of these things you know uh now it seems that you know with the with the advent of of you know artificial intelligence you know, in, in the consumer market, right? Because you can only imagine what's happening, in, you know, in, on the military uh, uh, capability. That they're just going to have these swarms controlled by artificial intelligence. And, and you know, they're, you know, some of them are going to be bombs and some of them are going to be surveillance and some of them are going to be a little bit of both, you know. Um, and and we want to turn over the, that, you know, kill or don't kill responsibility to computer program are, are these going to be like npcs in a video game or something that are like hostile in real life uh presumably oh that's fun presumably so all right well, scary shit <laughs> it's a nice it's a good it's a good arms race who can make a more hostile npc to to uh kill each other mm-hmm I think we have more autism though, so I think we'll make better ones, right? Uh, I mean, in our in our I, country, I, or, or at least diagnose more. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, and the thing is, is it's just going to turn into an arms race, right? Like this, this isn't what's going to buy security. This isn't going to be deterrence. That's not how this works. That's mm-hmm. not how any of this ever works. Um, you know, I, I really just have to put my eggs in the the American people push back on this stuff or we go bankrupt or something like that uh because i definitely do not want us going down this road um it'll be interesting to see how far down this road we get because now we're talking about technology that as you said is is very cheap it's very Mm -hmm. cheap you know this is not a super carrier that costs 14 billion dollars uh that's billion with a b right um yeah, we, we not could probably cool. make fourteen billion of these little tiny drones. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, exactly. And and oh man, yeah. So yeah, 
well, that's... Yeah, there's that, I guess. <laughs> I really don't have anything to add on that other than that I am categorically opposed to stupid ideas like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember there was a there was a, a group that was trying to get nations to sign on to a sort of a promise that hey we're not gonna we're not going to weaponize ai we are not going to turn over the responsibility of whether or not you kill a person to ai Mm -hmm. and there you know there were efforts like that and some of them were reasonably successful in the past um the prohibition on the use of uh gas on the battlefield yeah you know going all the way back a hundred and gosh when was that signed 120 years ago or something like that and i mean it did happen but pretty infrequently pretty infrequently for for a, for what it was which was a you know a potentially decisive uh military technology so it's, it's not like with some level of public revulsion and and we don't have weapons in space leadership. presumably you know do what we don't have weapons in space presumably we don't have weapons that's that's one that's held up Pretty much since yeah, we and we don't want that either, right? Like right. that's another one. We don't want any of this stuff. I mean, what we'd like is is to reach a modus vivendi where we can all stop doing this stuff. Because really, realistically, when you look at for the for example, China and the United States, the populations are graying very fast, and and actually the resources are going to need to shift not towards more bombs and ways to fight each other, but with how to care for older people who are living longer, who are needing more care uh, because they're suffering from diseases that don't afflict young people, but people are living longer. And so that's one of the re- one of the hundred reasons why the cost of care has increased so much. So gosh, and, and I don't hear the Indian government clamoring to do this stuff. You know, I don't, I, I don't see here Brazil clamoring to do this stuff. And these are the, the sort of the other major countries who are, you don't hear the European Union clamoring to do this stuff, the Germans. So it's it's really the United States that's driving this, this cart forward. And so, again, you feel some degree of responsibility for stopping this. But at the same time, you're you're very aware that... You know, it's it's you being packaged as innovation, right? Ah, of course, we're, we're innovating, yeah. right? We're innovating the, innovation, the, the, oh, yeah. the battlefield to save lives. We're innovating. We have to be ahead. We have to be years ahead of everyone, including our our adversaries, our our friends, our enemies, our frenemies. You know, like we we need to create the the you know the nuclear bomb before everyone else does. That's this is what we're doing again, right? We're we're literally it is. doing it again. It is. It is, and that will not cow anyone. It will just encourage them to work hard to create an equal deterrent, just as the Soviets did, just as the Chinese did, just as the North Koreans did, just as the Iranians uh, would do if they ever thought it was necessary. I swear if the next major world war is started by chat GPT. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, some of the craziest things. I remember having this conversation with you, Joe, um... I think we were talking about just like the efforts and the innovation when it comes to figuring out ways to kill people is pretty amazing. Just going back from the beginning of time to Mm -hmm. now, you know, we went from, you know, having a spear as like this revolutionary tool to, you know, a bow being a revolutionary tool to now having ballistic missiles (laughs) that go into space (laughs) <laughs> and then use gravity to fall on you at, at you know at such a speed, and um, now uh, self uh, you know self autonomous drones that I'm not sure how this works, but I'm sure there's some type of learning that they do right based off mm-hmm. exp- like battlefield they teach experience. themselves how to kill you, <laughs> yeah, and they yeah. they figure out themselves which what is a target and what isn't. And I'm sure they there's different levels of host like of hostility they could put them on, or you know, the, mm-hmm. the, maybe we can do another. Maybe we could do an episode on that in the future. Yeah, I'm interested. And you guys should do a treatment of that. That would be yeah. interesting. Sounds like it would be in our wheelhouse. Next next week we're doing we we actually already recorded it, but we're doing an episode on the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, oh. Talking about just uh, 
you know how it impacted Israeli politics. But that's something that we can definitely put in our pipeline. Um, all right, so we are at an hour and forty minutes in. So this is always amazing when we have these long discussions. Um, we're going to wrap this one up, everyone. So it's 11 p.m. Um, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Bro History. If you enjoyed the show, make sure that you rate and review the podcast. It is the number one way to support our show. You can also join our Slack channel. Uh, Danny, uh, anything else you'd like to add? Nope. Joe, before we, uh, before we uh, conclude, do you want to plug anything? Uh, well, there's the book, uh, keep an eye on the Libertarian Institute. Um, I do work there, so it is, I guess, in some ways self-serving for me to tell you to keep an eye on them, but they're always doing great work. The news desk is great. Um, there's weekly commentary. They're really starting to put out a good amount of books. Um, I have another one in the works, uh, about the, uh, the origins of the migrant crisis and U.S. foreign policy. And then uh, also, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to create a, a channel and start posting um, my lectures. Um, I was asked to come and teach history um, at a college here in Michigan. And I wanted to take the opportunity to use it as sort of a public access, like learning opportunity. And so I'm teaching 20th century European history and uh, world history since 1500 this semester. And I'm going to record them and put them up as a as a course on, uh, I think, probably YouTube, I guess. Dude, that's awesome. I, I not, love it when I love it when I'm professors not, do that. I, I, that's awesome. I, I'm really excited for that. Keep me posted when those lectures it. come yeah. out because I will I will 100 like we'll push them all the time. It's yeah. oh, it's, well, it's such a I'm public glad. service Thank you. when professors do that. When like really knowledgeable professors, they put their lectures on YouTube as a free resource because I found some great lectures that way, like some great lectures that have really changed my perspective on a lot of things. Um, I think I've sent you one of them before uh, on this on this lecture. The Churchill of one. Oil. Oh yeah, Ralph Rako did that with his with a lot of his lectures. I just sent you one on he did on Churchill, which is awesome. Um, so that's that's awesome, and I'm really glad to hear that you're doing and doing that. And um, I will definitely encourage people to 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 listen to those when they come out. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, all right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Enjoy your day. Peace. <laughs>